So when we say that microorganisms can have a source of electrons, but we don't talk about energy, um, that could seem confusing. And so I'm going to lay out what happens with electrons and its connection with energy. Um, what we're talking about is reduction oxidation reactions. Um, and we'll keep talking about this in lecture four when we get into fermentation. But for now, we're going to look at uh, reduction in oxidation, electron transport, um, respiration, things like that. So we care about electrons for a couple of reasons, but the main one we think about is ener energy production. Electrons are not energy, but the flow of electrons is a form of energy that can be converted into other forms of energy like ATP. Um, and so we get electrical energy whenever we have a voltage or potential. Voltage and potential mean the same thing. If we have like a, a cell, a battery cell like this, um, it has a negative terminal and a positive terminal. The negative terminal tends to push electrons. The positive terminal tends to attract them. What's going on is a set of redox reactions, reduction oxidation reactions, where this one is, it sort of holds onto electrons less tightly than this one does. And so as electrons flow through this wire, we can convert that energy of that flow into other, other forms. So, we are powered by two reduction oxidation reactions, generally speaking. If we're doing metabolism of glucose, one of those is where glucose gets oxidized. So if we combine glucose with water, we get six carbon dioxide molecules. So this is the oxidized form of carbon, where we take glucose, take electrons off of it, we take 24 electrons off of glucose, and what we are left with is carbon dioxide instead of glucose. Um, the, um, the, ex the extra oxygens come from the water, and then we release 24 protons. So uh, glucose and water together, um, they give up, or the, the, the carbon in the glucose essentially gives up 24 electrons and um, this whole thing loses 24 protons. Okay, that happens. That's only allowed to happen if these electrons have somewhere to go. And they do in our own cells. When we're doing respiration, we're using oxygen as the electron acceptor. And so oxygen gets combined with these electrons and some protons to make water. So the glucose loses the electrons, the oxygen gains the electrons. Um, okay, so that's what happens. And then overall, it gives us this very in, um, exergonic reaction. This reaction releases a lot of energy. Glucose plus oxygen. This is the oxidation of glucose. Um, this is what powers our cells, uh, at least when, when we have oxygen. And if you grind up glucose very finely and throw it into the air, it will ex you can get it to explode if you mix it with oxygen. There's a lot of energy in this reaction. It's just that these are stable enough that we don't see that reaction if we just leave glucose in contact with oxygen. We need catalysts to make it go, to get that energy. So... Um, the, the voltage between these two half reactions is very large. There's a very strong force pushing these electrons towards oxygen, from glucose to oxygen. So let's explore this a little bit um, because it will make more sense if we do. So we are aerobic chemorganoheterotrophs. So we use oxygen and we use chemicals for our our energy instead of light. We use organic chemicals for a source of electrons instead of rocks. And we use organic carbon instead of carbon dioxide. So the reaction I just showed you on the previous slides showed glucose and oxygen being consumed in two half reactions. And this happens at different locations. So let's say we have glucose in the form of sugar and candy and we have oxygen. Um, the the sugar is going to be oxidized. Oxidation is when 
something loses electrons. So the Skittles will become oxidized. They go through the oxidation pro um, process. And this is showing the same half reaction I showed before, where glucose gives up 24 electrons. And that only happens if these electrons can directly go onto oxygen. And oxygen in the process gets reduced. It gains those 24 electrons. And we have, it also combines them with the same protons that were released over here in this half reaction. And overall, it makes this half reaction. And that is very strong. That powers um, current through our electron transport chain. Um, so let's take a little detour to talk about how we talk about redox reactions. Because I just said will be oxidized, will be reduced. This confuses a lot of people because this is the oxidizer. Oxygen oxidizes the Skittles and gets reduced in the process. That terminology confuses a lot of students. So in this slide, we go through it, and you can skip this if you are comfortable with this terminology. We use those words, reduce and oxidize, in, in different ways. We use each of them in two different ways. One of those ways is like... Um, one of those ways is what a molecule does to another molecule and the other way is what happens to the other molecule so let's let's look at an example um, if we have this reaction a plus b goes to c or becomes c and let's say that this is a redox reaction where a takes electrons from b so let's describe this using this terminology um, there are two ways we can talk about this and I color code them these blue ones are the 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 top ones sometimes we talk about what a does to B where it takes electrons from B and sometimes we talk about what happens to a and what happens to B um, here's the mnemonic for remembering um, oxidation versus reduction and then we can describe this same reaction in several different ways. So if we're using this sense, what A does to B, we're saying A oxidizes B. And we can also say B reduces A. So electrons go this way. A steals them from B. Um, A causes B to be oxidized. B causes A to be reduced. Um, and yeah. But in the same time, the same reaction we can also describe it as a undergoes reduction and b undergoes oxidation and we don't have to use words like undergo we can say a becomes reduced a gets reduced a is reduced in this reaction b becomes oxidized b is oxidized in this reaction b gets oxidized um, and so i don't know do with this what you will the whole point is we have electron transport chains that can use this electrical movement um, ultimately to make a proton motive force and to, to um, make ATP. Okay, so what does this look like? Well, we have a lipid bilayer. That's the cell membrane in, in mitochondria. This is the inner membrane. In gram-negative bacteria, this is the inner membrane. Gram-positive bacteria only have one membrane, so this is the membrane. Um, and what we have is a series of um, enzymatic complexes that are going to catalyze reactions between electron-carrying molecules. So we're going to see different molecules in here, and they're going to be able to give electrons to each other and carry them in a chain all the way to oxygen. But they have to that has to be catalyzed by these enzyme complexes, and I'm going to draw these others in as we go. So this is a quinone. This is an one of the electron carrying molecules and this is complex one also known as NADH dehydrogenase. And the idea is th this catalyzes the transfer of electrons from NADH to the quinone. Um, two electrons can be taken from NADH and sent to the quinone. In that process this becomes what we call a quinol and we're left with NAD plus.
then this can go back and be a reagent in glycolysis in the citric acid cycle. So the next thing um, is we can draw in other complexes. And what we're going to see is that this quinol is going to donate electrons to a cytochrome. And a cytochrome is a protein that can carry electrons. And this is catalyzed by um, cytochrome BC1 complex. And this is based on what happens in mitochondria, but you would see something very similar in uh, most familiar bacteria that use oxygen. Um, so again, the two electrons go to um, this complex. This goes back to being a quinone. So it gives up the electrons and goes back to being a quinone. Now um, this becomes the reduced form of cytochrome C because it has gained electrons. And this is where we bring up the idea that when this reaction happens, it releases energy, and this complex takes that energy and uses it to pump four protons across the membrane. NADH dehydrogenase was able to do the same thing when it catalyzed um, transferring electrons from NADH to the quinone. Um, next, we have complex 4, or cytochrome C oxidase, and that's going to transfer electrons from the cytochrome to oxygen, and again, it's going to release energy. And this is where that half reaction happens, where oxygen, protons, and, um, and um, electrons become water. And again, that released energy can become a proton pumped across the membrane to make a proton motive force. The last step is taking all of those protons and that proton motive force and using that to drive this ATP synthase enzyme com complex. And it's going to rephosphorylate ADP to make ATP. And then our enzymes are able to use ATP as a form of energy. So all of this, taking NADH and using all this electron transport chain using oxygen, it's only there primarily to allow us to pump protons across the membrane where they set up this gradient and they have this strong force trying to pull them back in. And we use that force to make this ATP synthase complex go. And this whole thing is called oxidative phosphorylation. It's where we, um, we oxidize something like the sugar I was talking about before, take the electrons from it, put them on oxygen, and use that to energize the membrane like this, where we pump all these protons outside. So we have positive charges outside, negative charges inside. And then we have that ATP synthase. It allows some of those positive charges back in and uses the energy released to make ATP. That's oxidative phosphorylation um, or respiration. Um, and you might have heard of that as cellular respiration, and that's a fine thing to call it when you're studying um, human cells. But bacteria have lots of different types of respiration, and so we have to be more specific in bacteria and say this is aerobic respiration where oxygen is used. So again, this is um, the electron transport chain connects the electrons from carbon, like sugar, to an electron acceptor like oxygen. So the electron donor is the sugar, the electron acceptor is the oxygen. So this is, well, what would we call this if we were using that carbon electron, or that electron, sorry. What would we call this if we were using that um, energy electrons carbon naming scheme? What would we call an electron donor, especially one that is sugar. Um, the word for that would be um, organo, organotrophy, using an organic source of electrons. So that is what we do. Um, and again, that system, that um, energy electrons carbon system does not talk about electron acceptors. It only talks about the electron donor source of energy, which in this case would be this whole chemical reaction, and the source of carbon, which we're not even looking at here, but the source of carbon would also be the sugar. So some examples, 
We are chemo organoheterotrophs. Organic chemicals are everything for us. Um, we can use glucose, we can use lipids and fats to get energy electrons and carbon. And the electrons we would send to oxygen um, to make huge amounts of ATP. There are lots of other chemo organoheterotrophs in the world. Most fungi make their living that way. Most animals do. I write all question mark because I don't know of exceptions, but in biology, you've got to kind of prepare yourself to find exceptions to everything. This is the muskrat, um, and the muskrat is a noble animal that is equally comfortable on um, water and land, not unlike someone who likes to go pack rafting. And so um, if I would paddle my boat in Connecticut and Wisconsin, near a shoreline at dusk, I would see the muskrats come out and we would look at each other and be like, yeah. Um, but also the bacteria that we think about all the time, they're also chemo hetero organotrophs. Um, different from this would be things like cyanobacteria or chloroplasts that drive plant cells. They do everything differently from us. They're photolithoautotrophs. That means they get their energy from light they get their, their electrons from some inorganic source, which in this case is actually water. Um, and they get their carbon from carbon dioxide, which we cannot do. This only works because they have an endless source of this cheap light energy, which can drive both stealing electrons from water, and that's hard, um, it can drive the really energy intensive process of putting electrons on carbon dioxide to turn it into something like glucose. So this is really difficult, it requires a huge amount of ATP. And, but to get energy, well, what am I saying? To convert that light energy into usable energy, they use an electron transport chain and they send those electrons from water to oxygen. And it's not that different from our own electron transport chains. So their energy comes from light, but they use an electron transport chain to convert it into ATP. And it's a beautiful thing. You should really sometime geek out on that. There are other photosynthetic bacteria that don't use water as their... Um, electron donor, it's not that important. I just want you to know that every different combination of these things exists. Um, there are methanogenic bacteria that grow in crazy places. They use, um, well, they get energy by using hydrogen as their electron donor and putting the electrons on carbon dioxide. This is a terrible way to get energy. This is very inefficient, but it is possible and that means there's an ecological niche for an organism that can do it. So they use hydrogen for electrons, carbon dioxide for carbon, and they use the reaction between them for energy. So they are chemo, because they use that chemical reaction, litho, because uh, this is their source of electrons, it's inorganic hydrogen, autotrophs, because they use carbon dioxide for carbon. And you might find these in a uh, hydrothermal vent this um, deep in the ocean, these tube worms that live in hydrothermal vents have um, bacteria in them that do all the chemical reactions to steal the energy they need from the water. And that is more than enough for this lecture uh, video. And that is more than enough for this video. Um, I'm not as concerned that you remember my examples as being able to use that naming scheme, so be able to apply that naming system. There's a lot of stuff. Be ready to talk about oxygen and be ready to apply what I tell you about oxygen to that oxygen relationship naming system. And in the next video, um, we will look at um, specialized media for the laboratory, and that will connect very well to what we've talked about in this lecture so far. So I'll see you there.